Um, let me start out by saying I am truly honored to see all of you that took time out of your busy lives to honor my son, Bobby. And I, I don't know what everybody believes, but I'll tell you what I believe. I believe the more you talk about somebody, the more you remember them, they're not gone. They live in your heart. So, as I look around, I see a lot of you people I am meeting for the first time, but I am just so honored and thrilled with the stories I'm hearing from each and all of you about what Bobby meant to you. And and the biggest honor I get from you people is when s some of you have come up to me and said, wow, I see where Bobby gets his personality from. <laughs> you, and that, you know, God bless you. So I just want to read a couple of things to you. Uh, a lot of you have probably have already read this or seen it on the internet or whatever, but it's so the picture over here where you come in, the big portrait of Bobby. On it is writing, which is very hard to read, but it's Bobby's writing. And the, the, uh, that picture was in a photo exhibit down at Biddeford s several years ago. And my daughter, Leanna, we were hoping to get some pictures produced from that picture, and of course it was done by a professional. So you have to you know, get there okay to produce it. So um, Leanna called the photographer, told her about Bobby's passing, and asked her if we could get permission to reproduce his picture. And he was so kind that he said, I'll do you one better than that. I'll gift you that picture. So that picture is a gift from Bell Photography and Actually, I don't even know where they're from, but I just know the exhibit was in Bitterford. So, this is what the picture says for any of you that hadn't got a chance to read it, or see it, or hear it. And this is what it said. The title of the picture is called, A Letter to My Younger Me. Hello, this is the older future you I want to reach out to you and hopefully save you from becoming me, a veteran of the prison system for over 20 years. And at the end, this was done eight or nine years ago, so in the end it became over 30 years. So a veteran of the prison system for over 20 years. If you pay attention to me and consider my advice, you might avoid this particular future, and maybe you will decide to create something special with your life. First things first, accept the fact that you are special. You were born that way. Be yourself. You'll attract good people to you. When you try to be different in order to fit in, you'll lose more and more of your true identity. Always recognize that you need to be a friend to yourself first. Also know that your family loves you. And I guess that's obvious. So, don't overanalyze the love or compare it with the love of other families. They do the best they can with the tools that they have. Love them back without expectations and without condition, and the bonds will remain strong. Finally, wow, Bobby. <laughs> the bonds will remain strong. Finally, no matter what negative experiences you suffer,
They did not have to define you. You have the power of choice. Always be quick to smile, slow to anger, and treat all people with the respect that they deserve. That is how you will avoid becoming me, Robert Pazak. So that was Bobby's. That's what's written on his picture. And thank you. So I want to share one other thing with you, and I'll give somebody else a chance to talk. Um, OK, so this is just something I, <laughs> this is something I just want to share with you. It's personal, but I think it's appropriate. So this was um, this Christmas that just passed. I asked my grandchildren and my children, I said, I don't want a gift. I don't want a store-bought gift, something I won't wear, don't like, or whatever. I want a heartfelt card from you. That's all I want. So this, I want to share with you what Bobby's heartfelt card to me was. So it starts out, Dad. Aside from your generosity to your family and your love, you are generous and caring for those who are in need. Your ability to care for people is an example to your kids. You also understand that we are not perfect, that we have our own struggles, that you love us regardless. In the past few years, Oh, and you always do what you can to help us out. In these past few years, you've discovered and embraced your humorous side. You are funny. <laughs> and your, new your newfound love of singing, well, when Bobby started singing in the band in the prison, I thought I had to sing too, you know, so, so I bought myself a karaoke machine. <laughs> and, and I know I stink, but don't bother me. I get on there and sing my heart. I got a special hat I wear. And when I put on that hat, that's my singing hat, and I lose all my inhibitions, and I just sing. So, so anyway, he writes, you are funny, and your new love for singing, wow, you look so happy when you're singing. And you're getting better. <laughs> I appreciate and love you, Dad. I keep the fact that I'm your favorite just between you and I, because <laughs> all my kids say they're my favorite, and they're all right, you know. So he's going to keep it between you and I. Yeah. Although, oh, although I rely on you for so much, one thing you can always rely on from me, and that's the fact that I will always be proud to be your son. Love you, Dad. Merry Christmas. So, thank you for your time. I appreciate you all being here. Like I said, uh, Bobby is smiling. I know he is. Oh, one other thing I got to ask. One more thing. That's been my new. Remember, if you people that are old enough to remember Columbo, he always had one more thing he had to say. So, yesterday, I was sitting at my kitchen table, and I happened to look out the window, and I caught a glimpse of a cardinal. And of course, I know that cardinals, uh, to many people, are a sign that angels present, or you're being visited by a loved one. Or, so I saw the card. I just got a quick glimpse of it, red going by. So, so I'm looking out the window, and I see this big, giant patch of red. I'm thinking, what the heck is that? I'm thinking, well, it must be a look. It was so big and vibrant, it looked like it was probably a ribbon that came off a Christmas wreath. So I think, but I'm thinking, well, I didn't have a Christmas wreath. So, so then I moved my head a little. And I'm not kidding you. I looked out and I saw this cardinal. He may as well have been 
neon fluorescent because it was shh, shh, shh. And I swear that thing was this big. If it had been a fish story, I'd said it was this big. But, <laughs> but it was the biggest, fattest, brightest cardinal I'd ever seen in my life. And that was not lost upon me, believe me. So I just wanted to share that story with you. Um, I'll give somebody else a chance to say something. But again, I can't thank you all enough. Can't thank you all, all enough. It's, it's been an honor to meet many of you that I never had known. And what are you doing? Pushing me away? No. <laughs> I'm just getting in my spot. OK. All right, I'll turn it over to Leanna. Thank you. All right. So before I read what I wrote, I want to take a minute and thank every single person that donated to the GoFundMe pages. My family appreciates you all more than you know. And because of you guys' generosity, we were able to give my brother the send-off that he deserves. So from the bottom of our heart, thank you very much to all of you. Does this not bend? Oh, there we go. All right, here we go. Hold, bear with me. OK. No. Okay, so first thing you need to know about my family, and my family, we don't do half or step. We may not have all the same mothers or fathers, but we're definitely 100% family. In the wise words of my brother, Russell Davis, if you are my sister's sister, then doesn't that make you my sister too? In this family, yes it does. My dear brother, how do I explain what you meant to me? I guess the beginning would be good. When we were very young, he was a typical big brother. He always loved to harass the shit out of Robin and I. But if anyone else tried that, they were in for a rude awakening. So let me give you some examples of said harassment. Robin and I were blocking the dirt road we used to ride our bikes on so we couldn't pass. Why? Who knows why little sisters do annoying things. But no one should ever block Bobby's path, lesson learned, because he ran me over. He didn't just knock me down, he pedaled so fast he knocked me down and drove right over me. I'm sure Robin fell too, but he literally ran me over. Don't think we let that go. So for repayment one morning, he was sleeping in. Obviously, we were still holding a grudge, especially me. So we snuck downstairs and stole Dad's Bengay out of the bathroom medicine cabinet and snuck back upstairs to Bobby's room where he was sleeping in his tidy whiteies. We squirted the whole tube of Bengay on his underwear. It wasn't long before Bobby was wide awake, screaming and running around grabbing, well, you know. Let's just say Robin and I were in a lot of trouble with my dad for that one. As we grew a little older, our relationship evolved from him being my cool, to him being my cool big brother, and I went from the annoying little sister to the adoring sister, so proud he was my brother. When we were teens, all the girls loved him. Big surprise, right? One day I was getting out of basketball practice at Freeport Middle School, and Bobby was roaming the hallways looking for me. His hair was long and curly. He, it was the era of Michael Jackson. He must have had something on that looked like him because all the girls in the hallway started screaming as he's walking towards me. Oh, my God, Michael Jackson's in our school. And I was annoyed. I'm like, what? And Bobby's like, shut your mouth. He, like, he wanted that praise from them, so I just let him live his dream. <sighs> he never missed a mirror, a trait I think I may have inherited. It's okay to love how you look. My brother loved how he looked. Just kidding, not really. Fast forward a few more years. Robin and I are now young adults. Bobby's in Thomaston. We're at an AA celebration where we had dinner and bought raffle tickets to win stuff prisoners made at the wood shop. Let me just tell you, they weren't little items. There were some really nice things. So of course, we looked at everything, told Bobby what we wanted. I wanted this beautiful coffee table. 
The guy calls the raffle number. It wasn't my ticket number. Bobby gives him a look. The guy realized his mistake. Long story short, we left with the coffee table and much, much more. He would often tell me how his friends would see pictures of Robin and I, and they would say, oh, who are those girls? Which he would quickly respond to, watch yourself. Those are my sisters, and they're off limits to you. I think that's when Bobby had, I think that's when Bobby had to come to the hard reality that he wasn't the only good-looking person in the family. I think he struggled with that reality then and is still looking down on me right now saying, get in line, little sister. You know who dad's best looking child is. And by the way, don't forget I'm the favorite child too. Another sibling rivalry that will go down in history is who is dad's favorite? We're all convinced it's ourselves. I was so proud of all your achievements from hospice to college to learning the guitar. The role model for others you have become has filled my heart with pride. I love that people are finally getting to see the man I always knew you were. In August of 2020, when Bobby finally came home for good, we were so happy to start making memories for years and years. And little did we know we would only get two and a half years with him. Boy, did he seem to cram a lot of living life in those two and a half years. I'm so proud of all of his accomplishments in the sober community, his work with MPAC, and so many more things that I wasn't even aware of until the past few weeks. I feel like we were robbed of watching Bobby live a full life and bloom to his full potential. Although he was amazing and was working on what seemed to be like a million projects, he wasn't finished here on earth. He had so much more to experience out of life. We thought we had so much more time to make memories with him. My heart is broken. I feel like some part of me that can't be measured has been taken away and it has created a hole in my heart that will never be filled. With that said, there's a few of you out there who I have come to love like a brother. You know who you are. And you will help me fill that hole in my heart a little bit. Beautiful souls attract beautiful souls. My brother was a beautiful soul. And I'm honored to look around this room and see all the beautiful souls that he brought together. I want to thank each and every one of you for sharing your memories with us. We will treasure all of them. I'll leave you with one last thing my brother would want for all of us. That is to smile often, to think positively, give appreciation, laugh loudly, love others, and dream big. And in the words of my brother, I love and appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you all for coming and showing your love for my brother. Bobby was my brother, my best friend since he was released, my confident, and the only person who could tell me what to do. And I wouldn't give him too much flack. And he's the only person that could tell me to send him money, and I would. I wish this was a bad dream. I can't stop the flow of tears. The feeling he's been robbed of living out his dreams. And he was just getting started. I was waiting for the day we could travel to California so he could see what being a Samoan is all about. Family, faith, food, and football. I know you would have loved it and would have been a check mark off your bucket list. I wanted to bring you on the train to the Celtics, travel to New York City, Florida, and of course back to Illinois to complete that circle of our mother. It's not fair. I am so sad and angry. But what I have come to realize 
No, you weren't just my big brother, Bobby. You were a brother and a confidant to so many people. I didn't know your ability to be there for so many people and truly care for each one. To tell your story behind the walls in order to make change for others. So talented, sports, and we listen to you play your guitar and sing. I miss you so much. Every moment of the day, uh, I am uh, I am so lucky to have heard or seen from you every day. I'm so proud to be your sister. I remember the last thing you said to me, and it won't happen. Please show me signs that you're with me as I look for them from Andrew, too. If there is really a heaven, there's no doubt you are there. I just wish you were here with all your loved ones. And yes, you can be dad's favorite. You've earned that title. You made us all so proud. I love you lots and I miss you more. Fly high with the angels. Hmm? Mike, you're next. Not sure if I actually really need this microphone. So. <laughs> uh, for those of you that don't know me, my name is Michael. I am Bobby's baby brother from Illinois. Uh, my sister Melly and, Russ, and my brother Russell, we came out here because uh, our mother was not able to make it. So to represent our family, our end of the family. Uh, re regrettably, I did not know of Bobby and Robin until I was about eight years old. And uh, it didn't sink because I was such a young child until, you know, I became an adult and I realized I have an extension of my family. And that's outstanding. We're very, 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 very strong about our family ties. And uh, first time I got to speak with Bobby on the phone, it was amazing for me to have someone, another person call me, you know, you're my baby brother. And, uh, you know, getting to know each other, the similarities that we had in music, uh, sports, First, one of the first questions Bobby asked me was, well, how big are you? I heard you're big. <laughs> heard you might be bigger than me. And I was like, well, yeah, I'm your big little brother, as I'm a, a described by all my sisters. <laughs> and told him, you know, I'm six foot eight, 400 pounds. I'm, I'm a rather large guy. And he's like, all right, well, you know what that means. I've always been the protector of our family. It's your job. I hear that a lot. And that, you know, it was, it was odd for me growing up with, my sister and brother in Illinois, to have someone else say, you know, say that to me, that I'm, I'm to be the protector. You know, my parents always told me to be the protector of my family, and now I've got my big brother telling me to do the same. So, uh, regrettably, I never got the chance to meet Bobby in person as an adult. Uh, I had plans this year to bring my family out to, uh, so they could meet him, meet my brother, meet everybody out here. And, you know, time fell short. Uh, but coming out here in the last few days, hearing all the stories of everything my brother's done, good, bad, ugly, you know, the accomplishments, what he's done since he got released, it's just so overwhelming. You know, I love the fact of seeing everybody here and how many souls that my brother touched is just outstanding and amazing for me. And, uh, you know, I feel like I've got a little bit of him and everybody that I meet and shake hands with and talk to and the several people here today that have like look, looking at me like I'm a ghost because of the similarities of, of me and Bobby physically. And uh, so no matter what, I thank you all for what you contributed and attributed to my brother. You know, everybody in here had some part of making who my brother was to the bitter end. You know, everybody, connections are made between each other, you know. So it's not just he touched your lives, you touched his lives. 
And it sounds like these last couple of years with his newfound freedom, that it was an amazing life, you know, that he got to do such amazing type things in such a short period of time. And for me and the branch of our family from Illinois, we bottom of our hearts say thank you for everything that you have said, have done, or interacted with my big brother. And I truly appreciate it. Because one of the last conversations that me and uh, Bobby had over the phone was that he told me that, you know, even though we haven't met yet, I'm always with you, baby brother. I'm always with you. So seeing this really brings that to home for me, that he is with all of you, every single one of you, that touched something of his soul, and he touched yours. And I thank you all for that. I used to be a lot louder. Um, my years have humbled me a little bit. Yes. So again, I want to thank each and every one of you. I want to thank you for the love and support you have shown our family through the social through social media in person. Both. Please know we all found some peace as we worked through the first days and weeks of losing Bobby. We know that we have our darkest days ahead because this was something to look forward to. To share memories, stories, photos with each and every one of you. But just knowing that Bobby touched so many of you has given us comfort. He will forever be remembered in your memories. And that again will give us peace. I'd like to take just a moment to say a prayer if everybody can just bow their head. <sighs> Dear God, I lift up to you all of the friends and family here mourning at the loss of our loved one. I pray that you bring comfort amidst this painful event. We hold on to your promise of walking with us through the darkest valleys of our lives. And I know we are not alone, especially during this difficult time. With this condolence prayer, I pray that all of you, all of us, may be soothed as we find strength in you. Please watch over everyone here and take away their anguish so that they may see your light at the end of the tunnel. I pray that everyone here does not lose hope, does not lose faith as they grieve. For you have great plans for us, Lord, amidst all of this pain. Protect everyone here. Protect their hearts and minds with your peace, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, have you all seen the drumsticks back there on the table? Y'all probably like what, you know, Bobby played the guitar. Well, that's not entirely true. Bobby found his love of music when he was about 19 years old. Um, he played the drums, and he played them on my head. Um, <laughs> I, I went looking for drumsticks. Me and my husband had a difficult time finding drumsticks, so we, we found some in uh, up past where his dad lives. And when I explained to the guy, he wanted to explain to me uh, which drumsticks did which, which ones. I, I said, no, hold on. I said, I I'm not going to use these. I'm going to sit them on a table. I said, my brother has passed. I said, and, you know, you know, he used to play them on my head. So he gave them to me. And again, I gave him a big hug, shed some tears. And that's just one of the small things that has happened along the way that someone has given something for Bobby or done something in Bobby's name. Um, the other thing that Leanna did not mention is you see Bobby sitting here. Um, Bobby was cremated, and, and generally, this is a whole person. 
but there are five little urns that have gone out to people, and there's still a great big bag of Bobby left. So, <laughs> Bobby was a lot. Thank you, guys. Candace, you're up. What a group. What a group. Thank you very much to the family. Sure. For asking me to speak. I know a lot of you want to speak too, so I won't use up all the time. But I do have some wonderful memories which will stay in my heart forever. And I'm going to tell you a few stories. By the way, Bobby adored his family. He talked about his family to me all the time. And he would be so proud to know that all of us got to meet all the family. And I guess by extension, that's all of you in this room, isn't it? Not just biological family, but as folks have, folks have said before, he touched a lot of souls as he journeyed through life. Bobby always said that he could help everyone else. He would always be there for everyone else but he wasn't so sure he could be there for himself all the time. So I guess what we need to do, all of us, is we need to pay his life forward. Now, I met Bobby when I started the hospice program at the prison. We had a class of five, and some of those men are here today. Al, you want to stand up? Al remembers that event. <laughs> Nothing like this had ever been done at the prison before. I went into the prison. I had submitted a proposal, and I said to the warden at that time, I said, I have an idea. Would you hear me out? I think it might be something that would help the men who were dying seriously ill, but it would also help the men who were helping them as a program of rehabilitation and redemption. The first class did such a powerful job, brought such attention to themselves, that they the administration allowed me to do a second program. The class was intense, wasn't it, Al? Yeah, 150 hours. I had said to the men, you know, gentlemen, we all have a lot more in common than that which separates us. What we need to do is bring our humanity together. 
And I said, I'm going to put my humanity right on the table, and I would like you gentlemen to come up. If you want to help me develop the very best hospice program in the whole wide world, who's up for a challenge? And I said, if you are, you come and put your humanity right beside mine, which they all did. And I said, let's go. So when I got a, par a permission to do the second class, I also got permission to do a written application and a, an interview with each man whose security allowed. There was one gentleman who came in to interview, and they called him Paco. I had not met him before, and he came into the interview room, sat down, but there was something about him when he walked into the room. He had such a presence. I bet many of you have used that word over the years for Bobby. He sat down and started talking about why he wanted to join the hospice program. And about 10 minutes into the conversation, I said to myself, I have never met such a vulnerable individual in my life. I didn't say it to anyone else. I just said it to myself. This man has such a giant heart. The interview completed. I put him on my, my short list, and I said, this gentleman is going to be in this class. My list went back to security, and then came back to me. And there was a name missing. Called up the chaplain. And I said, Walter Foster was the chaplain at the time. And I said, Walter, where's Bobby's name? It didn't come back on the list. He said, oh, yeah, no, security said no, not this time. And I said, Walter, you know, I have not asked you for anything since I've been working here. But I'll tell you what, I'm asking you now. I said, you got to help me get this man into my program. Because I think maybe it just might be something that he's been looking for. Not that I'm the end all be all of anything, because I'm not. I said, please help me. So he did, and we did, and I got a second list back. And there was one more name added to it. And I smiled. And I said, gentlemen, are we ready to start? And thus the second program began. And maybe a couple weeks into the program, I, I was doing something after class, and I heard this voice say, uh, Candace, could I speak with you? And I turned around, and it was Bobby. It was Bobby to me, but it was Paco to everybody else, right? And he said, I understand that you advocated for me to be in the program when they weren't going to let me be in the program. And I smiled, and I said, well, I might have had something to do with that. But I think so did a lot of other people. 
And he said, I just want to say thank you. And I bet there's not a man in this class of hospice caregivers, and there are many in this room, and would you all please stand up? Serge, Jody, Brandon, Al. We had the best group of loving caregivers that anybody could hope to have, even in all of healthcare, to take care of seriously ill individuals and those that are dying. They were exemplary. I was and am so proud of them, and Bobby became one of them. But he was still known as Paco. One day, he came up to me again and said, could I talk to you after class? And I said, sure. And he goes, you know, he goes, I have a question to ask you. And I said, what's that? And he said, um, and he hesitated. And he said, you know, I really don't feel like Paco anymore. Because he had come with quite a history. He said, would you do me a favor? Would you call me Bobby? He said, my dad would be really proud. And I said, well, I have a question for you. Now, it seems like that's quite a name change in this environment for you. I said, would you like me to call you Bobby in class all the time? Or just when we're in small groups and private conversation? He thought about it and he goes like this and he goes, well, you know, yeah, that's kind of iffy, isn't it? And I said, yeah, uh, maybe, uh, you know better than I. I said, but, and then he goes, no, no, I guess this is what we'll do for now. He said, just call me Bobby when we're in small groups or privately. And he said, but just keep calling me Paco for a little while longer. And I said, you betcha. And I said, maybe someday everybody will call you Bobby because that's really who you are, isn't it? I said, the man defines the name. The name does not define the man. He goes, ooh, I like that. <laughs> and I said, well, you just remember it. Just remember it. He was one of the tenderest caregivers. There was a deputy warden in the infirmary one day, and I caught his gaze, and he was looking into one of the rooms. And it looked like he had tears welling up in his eyes. And I just stayed there watching him for a while. And after he left the infirmary and I walked out a little while later, he caught me and he said, I was transfixed. He said, the man that I have known for so many years and the man that I saw in that room holding a hand, rubbing a head, and telling someone he loved them 
was just about the tenderest moment I could ever imagine watching. He said, I couldn't take my eyes off him. And I looked at the deputy warden and I said, thank you very much, that is lovely. I hope you tell Bobby that too. I said, that's the man that I know. That's the man I know. He was always doing something for someone else. In class one day, he came in and he had something in his hand. And I couldn't tell what it was. And obviously, they don't, aren't allowed to bring a lot of things into class, as the men here know. And I, he walked over to the deputy, one of the deputy wardens, Charlie Charlton. You remember Charlie, guys? Yeah. She had taught the men how to crochet. At some of the larger prisons, like Angola, they teach the men how to make quilts and things for the beds. Well, she taught them, she thought it would be a great idea to teach them how to crochet. <clears throat> and some of them just loved it. Well, my executive assistant at the time was having a baby. And Bobby, because, you know, the men didn't have they couldn't give gifts to anyone, thought he would make that baby a little crocheted hat. And here is this big guy with these big hands coming in and I, I was sitting down and he just put this little hat in front of me. And of course, my emotions are only about this far from the surface all the time, right? And now is no, no exception. And I looked at that little hat, and I looked at him, and I said, oh my god, did you do this? And he said, it's OK, isn't it? You're not angry at me, are you? And I said, oh my word, this is the tenderest thing I have ever seen. God love you. And my executive assistant happened to be in class because she used to like to come once in a while. And my staff became friends of the men in the hospice class. And they came in periodically. And it was just darling. Now, how many of you knew that Bobby crocheted a hat one day? I bet not many of you. That was that incredibly vulnerable side of him. One day we were sitting at a conference, the public conferences that we used to have in the visit center, and I was sitting at a table with Bobby and some other folks, and they all left to go do something, and so it was just Bobby and I sitting there, and I looked at him, and you know, even when I was sitting down, and he was sitting beside me, it was like David and Goliath, you know, I mean, I, yeah. He looked down, down on me, and I said, there's something I want to say to you. I said, you know, all those years ago when I interviewed you, I really thought you were the most vulnerable person I had ever met. Your energy, your tenderness just came shining through. And he looks down at me with that stern look on his face. And I said, oh boy, I don't know what this is going to be. And he goes, Missy, you are the only person who could get away with saying that to me. 
And I said, I bet it won't be the last, though. I bet it won't be the last. There is nothing he wouldn't do for somebody if he thought they needed help. Absolutely nothing. You all know that. Maybe some of you were the recipients of that gift of love and caring. Any of you? Sure. Sure. He was so generous of spirit. So generous of spirit. He was a beautiful musician. I've never heard anybody sing Mary Did You Know like he did. And that's where he took his solace from his music. Dr. Bach, Dr. Bob Bach gifted Bobby with a guitar so he would have his own guitar to play. He recently did a song, many of you know, and the song was Abandoned Son. How many of you have heard that? A lot of you, yeah. I hope you share it with others. Are you? Excellent, excellent. He loved deep conversation. I remember once he had a roommate and, well, it was Greg, Greg Warmke, and um, other folks. And he said, I just love having meaningful conversation. And I said, that doesn't surprise me. He was very bright, highly intelligent, and he had a lot of emotional intelligence as well, as many of you know, as do many of the folks I know in this room. He was a man of many dimensions, and he just didn't lo live long enough to maximize all of those. He made a great attempt at it. He helped so many people. And I think for someone of Bobby's stature in many different dimensions, one of our responsibilities is to pay his life forward. I, like many of you, were privileged to know him. And I think because it was an honor to do so and to be able to know him, that is our obligation, like it is with all of us, not to let a life be forgotten, but to pay that life forward in as many different ways as we can. Because that is another meaning of life after death, isn't it? If we can take those voices that are no longer here and just pay them forward and continue teaching other people Yes, Bobby had his ups and downs, God knows. But he did so many good things to help many of you out, many of us out, that we want to make sure we honor that going forward. So I know it's a huge responsibility, but I hope you're up to the challenge and the task. There are a lot of people in this room that gave Bobby a chance. And I would like to take the opportunity to acknowledge a couple tables to my right. The business that Bobby was fortunate to be a part of before he died and the day he died, he was at work. And it's a company that so generously of spirit sent their entire crew
crew here today, their entire staff, all of their employees and their wives. And if the folks from Opbox would please stand up and be recognized because they gave Bobby a chance. And Ben Rich is the owner of the company, and I hope I'm not being presumptuous, uh, Bobby's family, but I'd love to have Ben say a couple words if he'd like to. Is that all right, Bob? And everybody? Ben, ben Davis. Thank you so much. Hi, everybody. Uh, thank you so much uh, for having us today. Thank you for having um, our team here. Um, I uh, was introduced to Bobby, met Bobby the end of September. So we, are, we knew Bobby at probably a shorter length of time than, than all of you. Um, but uh, he had a big impact on, on those people over there and our team. When I met Bobby, um, he called me one day. He shared his story. I told him what we were up to and said, you know, think about this because if, if it's something that, uh, if it's a job that you'd like, call me back in a couple days and, and uh, I'm sure we can figure something out. And about 90 seconds later, I got a text message from Bobby saying he was in and that he would like to... Uh, um, attach his hitch to our wagon. And that has stuck with me over the last uh, month or so since Bobby left. Um, that in such a short amount of time, in just the last few months, Bobby's uh, big heart and his empathy and just his way about himself that you all know really well uh, stuck to us um, so deeply. And uh, looking back now, uh, it was really us uh, who were attached to Bobby's wagon. And now we're attached to all of yours. So um, thank you so much for having us, and um, it will be great to get to know all of you moving forward, and um, just thank you for having us. There are some other folks in this audience, too, who may not want to come up and speak, or maybe they will, but I, I just, again, want to recognize everybody, but there was a couple here earlier that I'm sorry they're not here because they were neighbors across the street from me, and they were so kind to Bobby when he got out. Um, when Bobby got out and came to live at my house, um, you know, he wasn't familiar with this life out here, and he knew it was going to be a challenge and a struggle, and he... Um, was afraid nobody would welcome him to the neighborhood. And so Mike and Maureen Messino um, in my neighborhood just immediately invited him over uh, for picnics and just conversation and sit outside around the pool and have a uh, just enjoy the evening. So people like that really touched my heart because they were so giving of themselves. Lenny and Susan Sharon, a Susan right back there. They were, Lenny befriended Bobby and Susan I've known for years. She's the deputy director of Maine Public Radio and they are, became, Lenny became great friends with Bobby. <laughs> Some folks here to my left, um, Kathy Venaria and Jonine Eckhart and Scott Fish who, and Jason Carey who are doing the AV for uh, the Paisant family today. I thank them from the bottom of my heart for all of their love and kindness and everything they did for, uh, for and on behalf of Bobby's name. So thank you very much. Dana Stanley, who you'll hear from, I think. No, she said, no, you won't. Uh, so I'd like to have her stand up because Dana um, was an intern with me, a doctoral student actually, for two years who did research at the prison and 
she, uh, all the men that stood up before, all really enjoyed having Dana there. And um, Dana and Bobby and I were doing yet another grant together just before he died or when he died. And uh, Dana became a wonderful friend of Bobby's and the men. So thank you, Dana, for everything. <laughs> And there's just so many people here. Is Jamie Eller here in this room? Jamie? No? Jamie Eller, um, I will mention her. Um, she and her family welcome Bobby into their home. A lot of people would promise when men get out of prison, a lot of people say, oh, yeah, you know, I'll have you over for dinner. I'll... Um, I'll invite you and share you with my family. Well, not everybody follows through, right? So uh, Jamie Ella was the beautiful violinist in the band that played at the prison. Many of you have that CD. And she, I was hoping she'd be here today. Jamie uh, had invited Bobby back uh, to visit her family again on January 14th, but he didn't make it. And he had bought her a couple Christmas presents for the family, so I will be giving those to her um, soon. So um, Jamie was one of those people that did what she said she was going to do and made him feel welcome in the community. And Galen, Galen, would, would you stand up? She says, oh, jeepers. <laughs> Galen and her husband, Gustavo. <laughs> did performance art with Bobby and I, and uh, she might want to do some right now. <laughs> and yeah, she teaches at Farmington and her husband teaches at NYU. And uh, they've been wonderful friends of Bobby and Bobby just adored her mother, adored her mother. And he was always, wasn't he? He was always such a, dear friend of people who were, had varying abilities, who are vulnerable, who are older, who needed someone, a spirit in their life. And he was amazing with all those people. So there's so many other people in this room that I know did so much for that man and I had the privilege of doing what I could to give him an opportunity to su succeed in this life. So thank you to everybody for giving him a second chance. And I just wish he was here with us today. I love you all. So on this, there you go. There you go. Yeah. So that's on the back of all the. There. Okay. So there. That's it, Randy. Candace, are these are your these glasses? glasses? Don't, don't, don't ever leave your glasses. They're, they're. <laughs> I'm gonna make this quick. I promise. <laughs> um, my name's Shay, and I was blessed to know Bobby for a couple years. My husband knew him too from being incarcerated. They grew a really great friendship. Um, up. <laughs> I shouldn't listen to you guys. But is that better? Hold on, is that, we good? Can everybody hear me? Okay. Um, so Bobby or Paco, to those who loved him and knew him, and this is pretty much the entire room that loved him and knew him very well. Um, like I said, was a friend of myself and my husband's, and um, I was honored to know him. What little time I had to know him was hilarious, and 
Yeah, it was hilarious. That's all I can think of when I think of Bobby. And when I think of Paco, it's just the heart and the love that he had. Um, when I think of Bobby, too, I think of the beacon of hope and light that he spread through everyone. The, the strong and courageous man that fought for not just for, you know, his family, but for those on the outside that he could connect with, that he knew needed his help. The people that were in the same position or are in the same position that he was many years ago. Um, you know, not just that, but his voice to speak out for those who were scared to speak out. His voice for the people that were too afraid to speak up for themselves, that were ashamed of who they were. He was always that person that said, hey man, listen, I've been through it. You're going through it, don't be ashamed of who you are. The fact that he fought for so many incarcerated men and women too, but mostly men, trying to work with them through the early entry process and the fact that he let them know, listen, you screwed your life up. Yes, you did wrong, you had troubles, but this isn't the end of your story, this is a new beginning. And the fact that he would go out and just let those people know that you're more than an incarcerated person, you're an individual. You're someone who has the capability of starting your life over just like I did. And the fact he would just, he would just reach out to them. He was so humble about it though. He wasn't one of those that would boast and brag, oh hey, look what I'm doing, yeah, I'm the shit, yeah, look at me. I mean, yeah, he did that too, but he did it in such a humble way. He did it in a way that you could just sit there and say, can you believe this is the same guy that was incarcerated and has so many, look at him now. Like he made so many of us proud. I know his family was proud of him regardless of what he ever went through. And you know, my last great memory of Bobby was back in December. Um, my husband and I held an outreach event at Oxford Street Shelter. We were handing out donations and food to the homeless. And, Message my husband, he's like, yo, bro, what are you guys doing? He's, my husband's like, uh, we got an outreach event. He's like, all right, I'll be there. Just no questions, just, yeah, I'll be there. Came all the way up from Freeport with a couple bags of donations. Got to see his sister, Beanie, and he literally was just, it, it, it made such an impact on my memory and such an impact of who he really was. And all he did, he just, he helped me serve food, and I'm just watching him, and he's like, Hey, bro, what's up? Yeah, what's good? Yeah, yo, homie, hey. And just literally, they were just talking away with him. Like, he had that connection. He didn't care if they were homeless. He didn't care who it was. He had that connection with people because his heart was so full of love and so just pure. And I looked at him, and I was like, I'm like, thanks for showing up. He goes, yo, sis, anytime. He's like, I got to do something, man. He goes, the people that helped me get where I am, he goes, I swear that I'm gonna give it back. And that's what he did, he gave it back. And I couldn't think of a better person to honor than Bobby. And not just that, the fact that he worked in the recovery, all his recovery family, that we loved him so much. And it's just, it's just unbelievable that one person could change so many lives. One person, just one person can change so many lives. Look at this room. Look at this room of people. All the people that knew him, whether they were family, friends, so, you know, a close associates, the people that helped him. It just goes to show that, you know, people's lives can change thanks to one person. And, and I, you know, <laughs> this is why I keep going. This is why Randy keeps going. This is why we keep going for memories and for honor, like we're honoring Paco and the memory of, of, of Bobby, we're gonna keep doing it. And we're gonna keep doing it because we wanna help those and we wanna save lives, but we're gonna do it because that's what Bobby would want us to do. He'd want us to carry on, he'd want us to remember him, and he want us to fight the good fights that he was doing and the lives that he touched. The lives that he touched, whether they're still here or not, will live on forever through his family, through his friends, through everybody. So, and I want to thank the family. Thank you so much for having us. Like, it's an amazing honor and blessing to be here with you and to share my memory of, of Bobby with you guys. And I just want you to know how much <clears throat> he touched my life. <laughs> so, and when I go home tonight, I'm going to talk to Bobby and say, listen, 
I know you were there, and I know that you heard every single one of us remember you, and we're not gonna forget you. And he'll be watching all over all of us, every single one of us, you know? So thank you so much for having us. And You know, all I can say is, you know, I will never, ever forget that man. He was just more than meets the eye. And the fact that he was just, it was just Bobby. And when you say it was just Bobby, everybody knows what that means. He was Bobby, and he always will be. So thank you guys so much, and love to <laughs> love you guys very much. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Randy, and when I first got here tonight, or this afternoon, Leanna was walking me around. I've known the family since we were all kids. We grew up. We, we, all, we all grew up together, and Leanna was walking me around, showing me what was going on. And she took me over to that table over there, and she said, this is the sign-in book. So I signed in the book thinking it was a registry and it was to speak, and I really didn't know I was gonna be speaking, so. Um, but I, I'm honored to be here right now to be able to speak on behalf of Bobby. Bobby was a really good friend of mine. Um, we've known each other since Bobby first got here. Um, I went to school with Leanna. I watched Beanie grow up since she was little. I met Robin, I run a recovery group now that Bobby was part of, and his family's been nothing but supportive of our group. Um, I've worked with Dana and Candace on the effects of reentry after being 50 years old. I worked with the main prison advocacy coalition with Joe, Andre, Mateo, all them guys. Um, Bobby touched everybody, absolutely touched everyone, no matter who you were, what you did, Bobby had an answer for you. I take everybody's weight on my shoulders, so I'm not used to getting help. Um, but Bobby knows when I'm down, and Bobby would be there to pick me up. And I don't let people do that, but Bobby did it. You all know Bobby's a big man, and I'm a very small man. Um, he got the stigma of being Paco while well, he was incarcerated. He ain't Paco. He's Bobby. Bobby, you got a heart of gold. He always has since we were kids. He would give you whatever he had, even if he didn't fucking have it. I'm the last person who got to see Bobby alive. I seen him that morning. And it's killing me right now because he had no gas, and I gave him money for gas, and he got in a fucking car accident. I just, Leanna, Robin, Beanie, Ma, Big Bobby, I'm, I'm so sorry for your loss. I love you guys. Okay, so call Joe and then tell Joe to call that person and then we'll go there. Can you remember that? I think so. All right. uh, can you guys hear me all right? Um, I'm just going to start off by saying that since the day that Paco died, I think I've been a little bit numb and uh, it's not something that I've really taken the time to, to process or accept until the moment when I drove into here um, this afternoon. And my plan was to be here early, but I actually had to sit in the back for about 30 minutes. It's interesting to hear everybody's stories and hear the effect that, that Bobby had on everybody. And I know that everybody in this room like knows the man that he was and was touched by him in some way or another. And it's hard to sit here and think about what stories that I can tell you that you don't already have to know what a beautiful man he was. Um, 
before I met Paco, I met the story of Paco. And that story, ironically, was that when I was going to get to the main state prison, I should keep my eyes out for a big Somalian. And uh, I was like, okay, uh, duly noted, I'll look for the big Somalian when I get up to MSP. Um, and I think I heard some stories about Paco that are just, you know, myth and legend about the man that he was, the prisoner that he was when he was, you know, went to the prison young. And ironically, I met Paco, but he w he's not Somalian. So I didn't actually think anything of Paco. I had no fear. I had no hesitation. I had nothing other than meeting this guy. Um, and I think like so many stories that you would hear from guys in the prison, which I'll get to in a second, uh, my first interaction with Paco was about sports. And he came to me and he was like, I heard you could ball. And uh, if you know Paco, you know he's very competitive and he wanted all the people that, you know, he wanted, he wanted you on his team if, uh, you know, if, if, if it would benefit him in, in the long run. And it's funny because everybody wanted him on their team as well, knowing that it would benefit them. So I first met Paco when he was asking me if I wanted to play ball with him. And I, I say this part of the story, number one, because it's hilarious that somebody said he was Somalian. I'll, I'll never get over that. Just people's ignorance, not knowing the difference between Samoan and Somalian makes me laugh. But I say that because I met Paco like, at, like as, as Paco to me. And I know that Candace was up here earlier and said that the name doesn't make the man, the man makes the name. And to me, he is Paco. And to me, Paco is Bobby. And to me, Bobby is Robert and Robert is Paco. To me, my brother is my brother. And I, I, I personally don't care what people call him because to me, Paco is one of the most beautiful human beings that I ever had the honor of meeting. And I just want to flash back to the fact that Paco was my brother, which makes you all my family. And that's something that I don't take lightly, and I know that you guys know that. And I still can remember the first time that I met you all, and there's a picture up here of him choking me. Um, and that very much sig you know, signaled our friendship together, just always having fun. But I'm, I'm going to tell you some stories that you're, you wouldn't hear otherwise, because who a lot of you don't know is Paco the man who spent the majority of his life in Maine State Prison. I went into the prison in 2000, late 2009, early 2010, and I was 23 years old, and I met Paco very, very early on in my time, and immediately we, we became great friends. We bonded over sports. We bonded over, like Candace said, deep conversations, and I think for me, Paco saw me as you know a young man, never been in trouble before, coming in to do a, a pretty significant amount of time and I just knew very early on that he cared and that he wanted me to do the right things. And like last week, thank you to, to Jeremy Hiltz. I'm not sure if Jeremy's still here, but Jeremy opened his home to us to have a celebration for you know men who had been in prison with Paco and for people who had met Paco in the prison. And the Maine State Prison allowed us to zoom in about 30 guys from MSP who were also Paco's family into that celebration we had. And I wish those guys could be here today to tell you these stories for themselves so that everybody in this room who didn't know Paco from the prison could understand that the man that you knew out here is the man he was in there. And regardless of the legends and regardless of the stories and regardless of the myths, Paco is one of the most important people that will have ever gone through the main department of corrections because of the legacy that he left behind because of the people that he showed up for because of the people that he cared for and i had the privilege of being a college student with paco i had the privilege of being a hospice volunteer with paco i had the privilege of playing music with my brother and i think until paco passed i really didn't realize how close i was with him and the effect that he had on my life and it's really just an honor to be able to say that if it wasn't for Bobby, that I don't think I would be here today doing the things that I'm doing with my life. When I came home last year, I think it took about 20 minutes before he reached out to me. And I think he was more excited that I was home than I was. And 
the you know the shock of coming home after 13 years in prison hadn't really sunk in for me yet. And I don't think anybody will be surprised that the first thing that Paco told me was, if you need anything, if you need anything, I'm here. And you know, one thing about doing a long, a long time in prison is you don't know how to ask for help and you don't know how to be strong enough and brave enough to say that you need it. But to hear my brother who did twice as much time as me say, if you need help, I'm here, really gave me a peace of mind to be able to say, if I need help, I can reach out. And I can't tell you how many times I reached out to Bobby. And last night, when I was thinking about today, you know, I posted something on Facebook that just said I was thinking about him. And that last night, having a really hard night, there's nobody that I wanted to call more. Because I can't even tell you how many times I called him and he dropped what he was doing and he showed up. And I can't tell you how many times I learned that when he needed the help, that he would reach out. And that, that's one of the most important lessons I learned from him. And as many stories as I could tell you about how amazing of a caregiver he was as a hospice volunteer, how tender of a person he was, the, the respect and the love that he showed to complete strangers at the end of their life when we were in prison in the hospice program. You know, I'd like to tell you guys all these stories and there's just not time. But I'll tell you one story that I know Dana will appreciate, and I'll, I know that Serge will appreciate it, and Jody and Al. Because I think for those of us who were hospice volunteers with Paco, we learn more about ourselves and about each other in that time than probably any other time in our lives. And for those of you that thought Paco was just a tough guy, just prepare yourself, because these stories are going to let you know that he was so much more than that, like Candace was saying. But we had this one gentleman that, was in the infirmary for a very long time and he, he was suffering from some dementia and sometimes that was really awful to watch sometimes it was really hilarious to watch sometimes it was you know an honor to just be there and helping him but this gentleman at the end of his life became very like vulgar and, and a little bit racist at times um and we would be up in the infirmary and sometimes i would be with serge and sometimes i would be with bobby i mean we we all have these stories but I can remember a handful of times when this gentleman would look at Paco and say the most disrespectful things that you've ever heard in your life while we were assisting him with a shower or cleaning up his room, you know, coming, showing up and just trying to be of service. And I remember the first time that he said some racist comment to Paco, I, I like braced myself because I was like, oh shit, it's about to go down, right? Like, I, I think Paco is going to hit an old man today. I don't know what's going to happen. This, this is like, I, I, part of me just wanted to get, kind of get out of there. And Paco looked at me and I think Serge, he might've been with me. And I think he looked at Serge and then he looked back at, 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 at this guy and he just started laughing and he just started like, almost like egging the guy on to say more. And this guy looked at me and he looked at Paco and he looked back at me and he winked at me. And it was like this game that he would play with Paco and with some of us because he knew that he had a safe space. He knew that he could be vulnerable even at this tender time in his life, at the end of his life, that, that we were there and especially with Paco that, that he was there just to support him and, and have community with him in a really difficult time. And there's one other story I'll tell you about a good friend of mine who passed away in prison while we were hospice volunteers and he was about 40 days from release when he passed. And I remember as a group, it's something that we used to struggle with, how unfair this was. And Paco and I would have long conversations when we would be there at three o'clock in the morning because as a, as a hospice volunteer, we were with these men for 24 hours a day, seven days a week until they passed. And I remember one night having this conversation with Paco about how cruel it was that this man was gonna die in prison 40 days before his release. And Paco put things into perspective for me. He reminded me that if it wasn't for him being there, that he wouldn't have the love and the care and the support that we, were, that we were able to offer. And that if he was in a hospital, he wouldn't have 24 hour care and he wouldn't be around people who understood him and people who cared for him genuinely and wholeheartedly and, and got nothing in return other than the personal growth that we experienced. And it was in those conversations with Paco that I learned to see death in a new way as potentially a really beautiful experience because of everything that somebody leaves behind when they go and, and focusing on the positive. And as a result of those conversations, and I think all the guys in here will remember, 
with this gentleman specifically, it'd be two o'clock in the morning. And if he woke up, we would have dance parties in, in his infirmary room. And it's just like, you didn't laugh yet, but I'm going to have you laugh now. Cause I just want you to picture like four people in prison, like four grown men. I think all of us were doing like a minimum of like 15 to 20 years. And like, we would put Lady Gaga on because that was the guy's favorite artist. And we would just get, we would get ridiculous because it made this guy smile. And so like, if you can picture Paco dancing at three o'clock in the morning to Lady Gaga's, you know, 380 pounds Samoan wearing our prison clothes. But, but that, that's, that's the man that I, that I knew and that taught me so much. And, and the last story I'll tell, cause I feel like I've been up here twice as long as I wanted to be, but, um, you know, my, my good friend Tiana is here and a bunch of my other good friends are here. And this past summer, I think I had one of the best days of my life because Paco called me and I was having a hard week and he knew that I was having a hard week. And he said, Hey man, you know, just get out of the house and, you know, meet us at old orchard beach. And Lori was there and I was like living in Bethel at the time. And I was like, I don't know, buddy, that's, you know, it seems like too far of a drive. I'm not sure if I have it in me today. And he was like, I, I'm not asking you, I'm telling you to meet us in old orchard beach. We're going to be here. We're going to wait for you. And, uh, you know, so I got ready. I drove down to old orchard beach and I met up with, you know, with my friends and number one, if you knew Paco, you knew that when he saw you, the welcome that he would give you would literally just make you feel like nothing else in the world mattered. Th that exchange, like that love that he would give to you in that moment, no matter how messed up his life was, no matter what was going on around him, like when he saw you, especially if he knew you was having a hard time, everything stopped and he just loved you for that moment. And when I got to Old Orchard, that's exactly what I felt. And what I was going through that week didn't matter as much anymore. And, you know, there's two parts of the story that I'm going to tell. One is, you know, he had been asking people to go swimming with him the whole time, but nobody really wanted to go swimming with him because it's Maine, the ocean's cold. I don't get it. It's, I, I can't stand it. It's too cold. But, like, I, I did 13 years in prison with Paco, so I wasn't going to let him punk me out. So I was like, yeah, we'll go swimming. So, you know, I walked in, and for me, swimming in Maine Ocean is like I go up to my knees, I dunk, and then I run out. And he was like, no, we're going swimming. I, I still didn't really understand what that meant until we got to like, I'm six foot five and we got to the point where my neck was underwater and I was, you know, starting to panic a little bit because I couldn't feel my body. <laughs> and I looked up and I saw the biggest smile I think I've ever seen in my life. He was just so happy to just be floating and swimming in the ocean. And it was the moment like where I realized no matter what we had been through together in that prison, no matter you know, the suffering that we've experienced in our lives that when I saw that smile and just how free he was, like it, it just, it was, it inspired me. And about five minutes later, we're still swimming around. I still can't feel my body. I'm getting a little panicky at this point. And I'm trying to hint to him, like, I think we're good, bro. Like, let's, let's, let's go. And he was like, are you, are you, are you punking out on me? And I was like, I just was trying to be super tough, you know, and it took me like seven more minutes of being numb to convince him that it, it was his idea to come back in. <laughs> and, and so we did, and we, we came up to the beach and just the most hilarious thing happened. We were walking up the beach and there was a group of like six little kids next to where we were all sitting. And one of these little kids came up to Paco and looked him dead in his eyes and said, Maui, is that you? <laughs> And Paco, and if you, if you don't know, it's, you know, from the movie Moana. And Paco, literally without skipping a beat, jumped into character. <laughs> and, like, spent the next 30 minutes trying to convince these kids that he was, in fact, Maui. <laughs> while they just sat there and critically analyzed all the reasons he wasn't Maui. And <laughs> without skipping a beat, every time they came up with a reason he wasn't, he hit them with a reason why that, that, that thing didn't make sense. And... I think we, we, we all just sat there in awe, you know, watching Paco show up for us, but also just like in, in a moment, like be there for these, you know, for these little kids and completely make their day, completely make their day. And that's probably a story that they're, they're still telling to this day because it was like a very long 20, 30 minute thing of us arguing with, with the kids. And at one point, you know, they, they said, no, you can't be Maui. Maui has all his, all his teeth. And, and Paco was missing a couple teeth at the time. And... I wish I could remember the story he told them of how he missed, how, you know, how he lost his teeth, but it was hilarious. And that, you know, I just tell you all these stories just 
because I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but these are just a, a couple of the special memories that I have with, with, with Bobby. And, you know, Bobby came a part of my family as well. My family's over here. And uh, I remember there was a point in time where he was really, really struggling last year. And he reached out to me and he just said, bro, I don't know what to do. You know, I, I got to get out of here. I need something. And I said, you know what, buddy, why don't you just come up and stay with me for a few days? And he came up to my camp in Bethel where I was living. And we went to see Bob Marley at Sunday River. Um, I've literally never laughed as much in my life. And we went back and we played music and we talked about life and we talked about prison and we talked about family and we just, we talked about everything that you could possibly talk about. And the next morning we went and ate, ate breakfast with my family. And, you know, when I think about Bobby and I think about how bad I'm struggling with the fact that he's gone and I try to think about all the lessons that he taught me and all the lessons we learned together as hospice volunteers sitting with men at the end of their life. I'm just reminding myself of some of the things that Candace said earlier that I know for a fact he touched every single one of us in here because we wouldn't be here if he didn't. And when I look at the diversity of the people who showed up today, when I look at, you know, the friends of ours who have battled the same things that we've battled with, when I look at Sue Sharon, when I look at Candace, when I look at his family, when I look at the Kairos volunteers are here, and when I look at the Opbox people, and I can't even tell you how excited he was to work for you guys. I had so many conversations with him about how much he loved each of you and that job, and I just wanted to say that. You know, I know that Paco touched all of us in our own, in our own way. And I just, I'm gonna leave here today trying to reconcile with the fact that my brother's gone and try to come to terms with the fact that I don't have that phone call or that text message anymore when, when I'm struggling. But I'm also gonna leave remembering that no matter how bad off Bobby was, he would have dropped everything at the drop of a hat to help somebody, sometimes to his own detriment. And so I'm going to learn two lessons from Paco. One is to take better care of myself because I don't think he had any idea how many people loved him. And there was times when I would talk to him and I would remind him of names and people. And, and I know that he's looking down today and that he finally gets it. But I'm also going to remind myself that I want to be more like Bobby in my life. And I want to be somebody that brightens every single person's day when I see them. And I want to be somebody that nobody's afraid to call and ask for help, no matter how bad I'm doing. And I want to be somebody that just lights up the room every time they go in, because I can see today how much that part of him meant to all of us. So I appreciate you tolerating me, talk, you know, tolerating me talking for way too long and I'm going to invite Joe Jackson up here to say a few words. And, you know, I just want you all to know that I love you. My goodness. Um, well said, Brandon. Uh, my name is Joseph Jackson. Uh, first of all, I want to say um, condolences to, you know, the brothers and sisters and Bobby, um, you know, for that loss. Um, I'm the executive director of Maine Prisoner Advocacy Coalition. So I'm going I'm I'm to I'm address a little bit with that framework. Um, Bobby was on staff with us. And um, as, a, as an organization, um, we, we feel this loss. Um, I, I, you know, I hired Bobby when Bobby got out. Um, so I should probably say some other things. I'm AKA J-Rock. I'm a AKA JJ. I went to prison in 1995 at the old Thomaston facility. And Bobby was there when I got there. Back then, uh, Bobby, was, we wasn't on the same team. I, um, you know, I was, look, blacks kind of like grouped together and other groups grouped together. And there was one day 
and thank God maybe the prison official didn't know it, but a race riot was about to jump off in the weight room. And, uh, you know, right before, moments before about to happen, cops unaware, everybody's unaware, um, I went up to Bobby because Bobby was well respected, I was well respected, and um, we was able um, just to squash it. I don't know, um, I was talking to a friend this morning who had, you know, cut off his Facebook for the last four months, and so he woke up this morning to find out Bobby was gone. And, you know, he said, we grew up together. Now I know people, you know, talk, think about when we say you grew up together, you're talking about as kids, nine through, you know, 18 or something. But I spent 20 years inside a prison facility with a whole lot of men, a lot of men that's in this room. And when I say we grew up together, we, I mean, we grew up together. Um, Bobby was my brother. I heard Brandon say that. I heard a lot of people say that. But he was my brother. So when he got out of prison and I was able to bring him on staff, that's the first thing. I, he was one of the first people I wanted to reach out to. And the reason for that is because I knew who he was. Like people call me JJ sometimes and call me Joseph today and Mr. Jackson sometimes because I'm older now. And But Bobby was showing up. I, pay, I paid him $20. He, he got 20 hours a week from me. But he worked 40 or 50. You, 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 can't, you can't just bring and hire somebody that... Um, to do a job that they were done for free. He would have done it for free. He loved what he was doing. He believed in trying to make a change and trying to change a system that kept failing us over and over and over again. Bobby was struggling. He struggled. And I understood the struggle more than probably anybody could possibly know. I knew what it meant to do that much time. I knew what it meant to come out and still feel like you didn't belong, still feel like you wasn't worthy, still feel like you wasn't, it wasn't good enough, that nothing you did was going to make it get over that hump. I knew that. I knew what that felt like. And even as a person that's supposed to be the head of running an organization and watching my friends spiral, I was not going to turn my back on them. And I didn't. I said, this is a time where a lot of people will say, you go your way. But I knew I needed to pull him closer. Oh, my God. Oh. I've lost a lot of friends. People go through that, get out, and they're struggling. They're not getting the support. And I've lost a lot of friends. And this one is almost too much. I didn't know what I was going to say when I came up here. I've never lost somebody that was working for me, but that's my brother. I love him. People heard many things being said about Bobby, like the big heart and all of that. But when we was in prison, prison politics, navigating a system of filled with toxic, toxic masculinity, there was no room for softness. We were all moving through a world where we were trying not to get hurt, trying not to appear weak, trying to be strong. And here I met this man 
and I've met many men since then that can't be defined by the act they committed. It's just beyond me. I spent 20 years in a facility watching people that the society called monsters that I was viewing not as such, that I was viewing people that were beautiful, their soul was shining bright, that they were about helping other people. I saw that in so many individuals. And I just couldn't walk out of prison and let them continue to do the things that they were doing to people and not do something about it. And there's a whole lot of us out here now that feel that same way. I've lost so many people and a friend of mine said, every time you seem to lose somebody, you come back fighting stronger. Well, that's damn sure hell what the hell I intend to do. Because I know that there are still other people out here struggling. Bobby knew that. Bobby was committed to doing it. And he was committed to doing it for free if he had to. So you know damn well I'm finna commit, commit to doing it. I wanna thank everybody. I'm sorry for me just breaking down because I don't, I don't know how I have been holding myself together since I heard that news. My organization, we went right into how do we fix and support mode? Because that's what we do. We want to support families and the people that we've been around. So instantly my comms person was like, yeah, oh, let's create a GoFundMe. Let me reach out to Candace. Let me reach out to Bobby. Let me make sure that folks are being supported and feel like they're being supported. That's my hat. But I haven't had a chance to grieve for my brother. Uh, I want to thank my wife because, you know, she helps me try to get in touch with some of those feelings I be trying to bury. Uh, but I can just tell you that the day the call, she was in the, in the truck with me when we got the call. And she broke down just as it was being reported. And I just couldn't hold back. But even those tears I shed was not, couldn't touch the ocean of tears that I hold. Uh, that was my friend. I love him. I love everybody that, like, we've been in touch with. I love my brothers that's been in prison with me. I love them because we went through the same thing. You are my brother. And, uh, I just want to thank everybody and just thank you. That's going to be easier. <laughs> My uh, name is Johnny Neckart. I am from the Bangor area, and I have been a hospice volunteer for 19 years. Uh, I had an opportunity during the time that, that the program existed and Candace was, was running it. We were invited into the prison to have um, a day of learning. And the way it was presented to me is, well, you know, these guys are prison volunteers. It might be good if they talk to you. Maybe you have something that you could share and, and they could learn. And conversely, you'll get a sense of the difference of what it's like. We do these things all the time. And as a hospice volunteer, you have the responsibility to do continuing education. So I was interested and uh, decided I would go. And the first day I walked in, I have to tell you, I was scared at, at half to death because I didn't know what to expect. We were um, taken to the community room and walked in and the men were lined up. The inmate hospice volunteers were lined up to greet us. First person that greeted me was Bobby. 
And um, he was gigantic in size. I still remember I was like, you know, looking, looking way up. He introduced himself, welcome to me, explained, you know, what table to sit at and, uh, you know, where to get our materials and all that. And I'm like in awe and overwhelmed that this isn't half of what I thought it was going to be. We spent that whole day with them. We were with them constantly. Whenever there would be breaks, the men would come and sit with us. And I think the first day, Bobby came. And I left at the end of that day speechless, absolutely speechless over what I'd experienced. And he'd been the first one to introduce it to me. And I got home and I talked a leg off my husband who was trying to figure out what the heck happened at the prison today because you won't stop talking about it and talking about these men and how much you liked them. And I was looking for the next time to go back. And for five years, I had a privilege as many times as I could to take advantage of the program and be there. And it... It, without a doubt, I am, I just turned 75. That time was the greatest experience of my life. And I've been a very blessed woman. I've had, you know, a, a, a gentle time through my life. And this was exceptional to me, what I was learning from these men. We weren't teaching them anything. We were learning from them. And I felt that their experience, first of all, with, with the, the patients they were working with and their responses were way beyond anything that we were having an opportunity to do, the intimacy and the personal quality of it. Beyond that, what we were learning from them as men, as human beings, opened my mind and my heart to such a level that it had never been before. I think that there is this sense of crime and punishment in our society that is so distorted by the media and so distorted by how it's presented to us. And I, after having so many opportunities to have encounters with him, and other men, Al, and I haven't talked to a, a few of you that I remember so clearly. Um, it, it changed my life to the point where I sat back and realized there, but for the grace of God, go any of us. Any of us could be there. And maybe at from this awful circumstance of this man losing his life when it had just really been given birth to. Maybe what we have is legacy. Maybe we have an opportunity to learn and grow. I speak to everyone about this, that I can, you know, wiggle it into the conversation of what this meant to me and what, what I learned. And it wasn't only them. It was when they talked about the other inmates that were in there and why they thought they were there. Those are circumstances that were very understandable to me, how that, that could happen. And I have, two of our sons are, are educators, and I've told them I expect them both, when they can, to find their way to the nearest prison or jail and volunteer to teach something. Volunteer to teach reading or math or just simply, you know, entry-level skills because I expect that to them, of them. And our other son is a physician, and I've said to him, at some point when you retire, find a way to give back in any way you can use your skills, or you could see yourself could go in. 
I am a real advocate for this. This really means something to me. And I wanted to come down from Bangor to say that to all of you today. Legacy is way beyond the prison population, changing the mind of the public so they begin to grasp and understand why these things happen, why every child born who is in my mind perfect can have life trip them up and they stumble and they fall. And who are we to say we can't help them with that, to be other than what they are? So legacy, legacy is what Bobby has given me, his legacy. One other last thing that I, I want to say, beyond hospice, I work in uh, bereavement as a facilitator. And the one piece of advice I have for you, for the family and for everyone that held him close, be patient with yourself. This is, this is, a, this is not a, a, a short walk. It's a long walk for you. Allow your feelings. Be patient with your feelings. Because that also is part of, of honoring his legacy, of allowing when the anniversaries come and you go, oh God, I can't, you know, I can't face the day. With each and every one of them, you will deepen and grow closer to him in the process of grieving his loss. You can do it. It's an honor to this fine man. And even though I didn't really know him as personally, and I've loved hearing the stories, I will never forget him because he was my entryway in understanding something I needed to understand. And I'm really glad to share that with you today. Bless you all. There we go. Okay. So, Garolyn. Yes, ma'am. And after, if you want, after you, if you want to just call that name and tell them to do so on and so forth. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm, I'm Galen. Um, oh, it's okay. It's all right. <laughs> um, despite Candace's encouragement, I'm not going to be performing. But um, I, I realized as, um, you know, listening to you all that um, celebrations of life are, are ritual. And ritual is all about collective memory encoded into action. And so in many ways, uh, we've all been performing um, this, this ritual with one another. And I want to thank uh, Bobby's family and, and, and friends for carving out this, this space and time for us to, uh, to, to be together. Um, so as Candace mentioned, my husband Gustavo and I, we, we had the great um, honor of, of getting to know Bobby, becoming friends with him, and, and also a tight-knit um, group of people uh, working on a number of creative projects that were connected to the, the Freedom and Captivity Initiative. And um, I guess I wanted to share a, a couple of, of memories, one of which has to do with, with one of those works, uh, which was a video, um, a two-minute video uh, called um, uh, um, Collage of Pictures. And I, I suspect I'm, I'm getting this vibe, uh, or I've been getting this vibe um, this afternoon that a lot of you have seen that. And um, I remember when, when we finished working on that, um, that piece, we, we told Bobby we shared it with him and, and we asked him to just hold off for a little bit while we sent it to MPAC because it was a part of their, their legislative um, push a couple of years ago to, to work on legislation to get compassionate release for, for folks in the prison who um, you know, were aging uh, or had dementia and just to you know, place them somewhere else besides the, the infirmary to, to get care. And um, he was just really so proud of that, that work. And I think he immediately sent it off to all of, all of his fans. And um, 
you know, I, I guess I wanted to say uh, about that work that, um, you know, we really actually put him through the ringer, <laughs> making making that that video because um, we were, you know, on location, you know, asking him to trudge through um, two feet of snow at, at uh, the the Thomaston um, site, um, spending time there, and um, we had him. What else did we have him do? I know his his thighs were burning when we were out at the Owl's Head Lighthouse, and we. You know, just had him do take after take of climbing the stairs at the lighthouse, getting different angles. Um, yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure he cursed at us uh, a, n a number of times. Um, yeah, tiptoeing. I guess the other memory was tip tiptoeing around. Uh, uh, you know, all the rocks at the uh, the the beach at at Wolf's Neck State Park, which, as some of you know, was one of his his favorite places to go. Um, but, you know, I, I think the other thing I wanted to share is that early on in, in our conversations with him, as, as we were getting to know him, Bobby, you know, opened up to us about um, the box. He used to talk to us about the box a lot, this box that he felt um, he was inside uh, as a kid, um, a biracial kid growing up here in Maine a kid that became a systems-impacted kid uh, who then matured into a systems-impacted adult who then became a man who made impact on systems. And, you know, I asked him um, as we were thinking about what, what our work together would, would look like, he said um, he, he wanted... Um, to, to have the, the box sort of like front and center. You know, I asked him, should, should it be portrayed in the work we were, were doing? And he said, you know, the box is always, is always present, is always part of the story. What is the story if the box is, is not there? Bobby came into my life at, at a time of, of great personal transformation uh, for, for myself, but, you know, I've been reflecting on how really um, he was integral he was integral to that transformation, and um, I think he knew that. I, I hope he knew that. And I also hope that I hope that he knew that he taught me a lot about how to carry what cannot be fixed. And he taught me how to, to do that, to be able to proceed with clarity, poise, and purpose. Thank you. <laughs> Katie uh, Limacox, maybe? Katie? Katie, are you here? How about Cuba? Let you tell them. Okay. Thank you. Cuba, you're next. Sorry, we're just all right. I hadn't planned. My name is Lenny Sharon. I'm a criminal defense lawyer, and I've been practicing criminal defense for 53 years. Um, I learned early on when I was in law school in 1967 that I wanted to be a criminal defense lawyer because I knew that I wanted to stand between my clients, most of whom are of color, poor, and stand between them and a system of uncaring judges, vindictive prosecutors, and racist juries because I was convinced that if my client was going to lose their freedom, to me the most precious thing we have, that they were going to have to come through me. I didn't get my education about prisons or what it was like in our system from some textbook written by a white professor. I read books by Eldridge Cleaver, Saul on Ice, George Jackson, Soul Dead Brother, 
Blood in My Eye, Geronimo Pratt, Huey Newton, all Black Panthers, and all revolutionaries who have been incarcerated in a horrible system that remains horrible. I joke that um, I spend more time in prisons and jails than most of my clients, which I guess is a good thing. But for me, that's my continuing legal education. I enjoy going to the prisons. It's like an oral history for me to learn what it's like, because I have no idea as many years as I spend, as many times as I've been in joints, as many people as I've known. I've been to Attica, Leavenworth, Lewisburg, some of the most horrible penitentiaries. And every time I hear that door click behind me, I get nervous, you know? I'm always worried, am I getting out of here? And I always wonder what it must be like to hear that door click and know you're never coming out, maybe doing life without parole. Or like Bobby, 30 years, Brandon, 13 years. I mean, it's unimaginable to me. So I try to learn from them. And um, I met Bobby through my wife, who's been introduced, Susan Sharon who has the heart of a revolutionary as far as it comes to prison and has reported on the conditions in prison and I learned from him like I learned from all others and, and Brandon, Joe Jackson, Brad Chesnell, I can name a million people what it's like to lose your freedom and to be subject to that system. But I also learned from Bobby when he got out, and that's no mystery to me, but I learned more from him. That, and as Joe said, getting out is as tough as getting in. I mean, you got that conviction, you put that on a box uh, when you're looking for an interview, good luck. Good luck getting hired. Good luck getting insurance. Good luck getting anything. So I admire all of you who continue to fight so that the people who are released from the penitentiary will have a life of freedom, as difficult as it might be. But I've had the great fortune of going out with Bobby. We went out to dinner shortly before Christmas, and it was great. It was a really wonderful evening. Bobby and I practice law in Lewiston, and um, we went to, we were going to go to Da Vinci's, Bobby's favorite place, but they were having a Christmas party. So he got in my car and we drove up to Marco's, another Italian restaurant, a little further out in Lewiston. And on the way up, he, we streamed his song um, through my car radio, a fancy car for a lawyer, right? And uh, of course, I'm like, uh, Candace, my or Bobby, my emotions are right on top, and I start crying in the car. Um, but anyway, we got in and um, we were having dinner, and Bobby says, "You know what I love about you, Lenny?" He says, "You're an old soul." So I said, "What do you mean, old, bro?" I thought he was like <laughs> about my age, but I, I knew that was a great compliment coming from him. And then I said to him, "I said, hey, we were just making conversation. Bobby's chewing his food, and I said." Hey, bro, I said, who did you used to walk with in the penitentiary? He looked at me like I'd grown a third eye. And he goes, I didn't walk with nobody. They walked with me. And that is Bobby. When I was listening to y'all speak, especially the folks that were Brandon and other folks that were in the hospice system, it seems ironic to me that Bobby, who gave his incarcerated life to being there for people who were dying should die alone on a highway in a crumpled car. That's sad. But I just wanted to say in closing, as you said, and I, I'm sorry I don't remember your name, that my legacy to Bobby is this. My name is Lenny Sharon. Again, I practice law in Lewiston. For any of you who want to go to Old Orchard Beach, who need anything, who want to have dinner, lunch, sit with me, talk with me, need something from me, I'm in the book, man. And that'll be my legacy to Bobby. I can't imagine standing in his shoes, stepping in for what he did. But if I can just be there for one hour, one day for any of you, oh, y'all who need that, who have been formerly incarcerated, families who have people in the joint, 
just give me a call, man. That's my gift to him. I hadn't planned to speak, but I know he would have been disappointed if I didn't tell a few stories about him. I love Bobby, and I'm going to miss him. Hey, everybody. Um, so I'm Cuba, and uh, Bobby Paco was my brother, um, is my brother. Um, we all came out of Missy P's womb. We incubated there for a time and we spit back out onto this, this fine place. And, and, uh, I can tell you on the inside, we weren't necessarily what I, what I thought of as brothers. There was a pecking order, see, on the inside and Bobby was up here and I was down there you know, somewhere. And I was just fortunate to be able to walk with him sometimes behind him, you know, and just, you know, walk in his silhouette a little bit, you know, I was fortunate. And uh, so in the prison, you, you know, in that pecking order, you, you kind of speak when you're spoken to and you stay in your lane and so on and so forth. And, and I learned that really early and I, and I walked with that. Right. Um, and it wasn't until maybe my second or third year in that I was given permission to speak to Paco. And I'm, some of this is, is jest, but a lot of it is true. There's a, there's a lot of truth in the joking. I was given permission to speak to him by himself. We were sitting in a, a, a college class together and, you know, I'd always, like you heard others say, before, before coming into prison, you hear this legend, this Paco, this Somalian, you know. <laughs> I, might have, I might have gotten that confused. Sorry, uh, I told you he was Somalian. He's actually a Samoan, sorry. Uh, no, that wasn't me, but you hear this legend and I had seen him long before I spoke to him, much like just about anybody else. You know, you, you wait and you want to know what's going on. And for years I had seen him and, and admired him. Good guy, leadership. I saw it all. I saw it all. I, I could see it, you know, um, and he was my brother. You know, we were in this womb together and we were Kairos brothers together. And it wasn't until we were college alum that he said something directly to me that uh, causes me to tear up now, but then it, it gave me the biggest smile and that was if anybody has a problem with you, you tell them and come and see me. And that was the endorsement of all endorsements in the big house, right? You know what I'm talking about. If anybody has a problem with you, you tell them, come see me. Now, I didn't need to tell anybody to go see Paco because they were going to have to come through me first. <clears throat> so that's the story that I'm going to tell, but Boy, did that give me wings. <laughs> you know what I mean? That gave me wings. I was able to soar and, and be free and, and walk with my head up and, and understand that, you know what, I have, I have people who, who are looking out for me. And it wasn't until some years later, I went on to a different facility, ended up getting out and linking up with uh, organizations so I could continue my progression in this, this new world. And um, he came on and joined Impact with us. He was actually there before me, if I, if I remember correctly, but we began to have a lot of proximity. You know, I'm always with Bobby and talking to him and, and reminiscing. And it wasn't until a dear friend of mine died that we actually took another step because until then he was still Paco. He was still that guy that whose silhouette, you know, and 
But after losing this other friend, I said enough is enough, you know, enough of me secretly admiring these guys who meant so much to me. I just, I wish I had told Tony how much I loved him. In fact, I did, but it wasn't, it wasn't, it didn't hit, it didn't hit the right spot. And I just wanted to reach Bobby because he was in much the same place. And I, I just wanted to say, Pac, you know, I love you, man. I, I've loved you from the day I met you. <laughs> you know, you, you gave me wings and I told him that. And we confided a lot of things in that, in that two month period of time. Um, and he once again extended that branch of help that I needed during that difficult time. You know, if you need anything, you come and see me. If you, if you need anything, you come and see me. And here's a guy who I was struggling, you know, emotionally and, um, in my business and in my relationships. Um, but he was struggling too, but he was there for me. He was there to help me move projects along. He was there, you know, when other brothers of mine were going off and, and, and doing their thing, he was there and he said, I'm here, you know, and we worked together and we loved each other. And, and, and so for that, you know, it's easy for me to sit here and say, hey, Bobby's my brother. But one thing I can say and I'm proud of is he considered me his brother. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of that. Anyway, that's my time. I don't, I don't want to take up too much time, but thank you. All right. I think it says Luke. Is Luke still here? Then after Luke, John, you're up. Hey everyone, my name's Luke. Um, first of all, my condolences to the family and uh, may God bless and comfort everybody in this room. Um, as many people said today, Paco is a brother to me. I met Paco in the end of October of 2020. Um, I had just come out of a stent of incarceration and, and he had came out a few months previous to that. And I had the benefit of, of uh, sharing my experience, strength and hope at a meeting one night. And uh, I remember this enormous man walking in this meeting. And as many people have spoke on today, his presence just filled the entirety of the room. You know, and he, he had this radiant smile and energy about him. And as I sat there and I told my story, um, he just stared at me with this intensity and this blank expression on his face as I was telling my story. And I'm thinking to myself, please, God, don't let me have screwed this guy over in the past. And uh, <laughs> that wasn't the case. Um, he came up to me after that meeting and he said, uh, he said, my name's Bobby, but a lot of people call me Paco. And I said, well, what, what would you like me to call you? And he said, you can call me whatever you want, handsome. <laughs> and that's, that's the type of relationship him and I had. Um, we would always, always joke around. Um, but, but he expressed some sincerity that evening and he, and he told me how much he appreciated um, me being vulnerable with my story and, and the things that I've, that I've uh, traversed in my life and some of the things that uh, nobody's fault other than my own situations that I've put myself in. And, um, you know, we got very close. We, um, we talked a lot. We went out to to dinner together and and one thing um as any of you know is that man can eat and so can i so we got along great um you know but but the conversation and the support that we had of each other and you know over the past two and a half years um we've both had our struggles 
you know, and, and he used to always, um, he used to always say to me when I, when I would sit there and, um, and, and tell him that, that I understand what he's going through. And, uh, you know, he would, he would look up to me and I was like, man, I've been exactly where you are right now. You know, I could, <clears throat> I could identify with that struggle and, and, um, everything that he was going through because I've struggled like that in my sobriety over the years. And, um, I always tried to make sure that, um, you know, I, I treated him the way that, that I wanted to be treated with love and compassion and understanding, um, through anything that he was navigating and, and he gave me that same respect. Um, you know, I, I like many in this room haven't, haven't really even been able to process, uh, his loss. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been, we've lost so many people over the past couple of years. Um, you know, that, that, that I feel myself that I've been desensitized, uh, to loss, you know, and I still haven't, uh, taking the time, I guess, to um, to sit down and, and properly grieve his passing. I, I remember uh, when when people reached out to me and told me to turn the news on and um, told me that he was gone and, and told me what time it had transpired. And I said, that's impossible because him and I were on the phone with each other at that time. And... Uh, you know, I, I was able to look back in my phone records and about nine minutes before that tragic event, him and I had, had said our goodbyes. And the, and the greatest gift that, uh, that he was able to give me um, in this whole process, in this tragic event, was um, for the first time ever... Um, somebody passed in my life that I didn't sit back and go, man, I wish I was able, you know, to tell that person how much they meant to me, you know, before, <clears throat> before him and I got off the phone that day, we told each other how much we loved each other. And we were able to express the gratitude and appreciation that each other's influence in, in each other's um, lives, you know, and the fulfillment of the friendship that we had, um, we were able to advocate and express uh, that generosity to each other and that, that vulnerability you know, which is something that, you know, is foreign to a lot of us that, that walk the roads that we walk. You know, we spend our whole lives trying to be tough. And, um, you know, I will forever cherish Paco's memory um, in the fact that, that he, he was a man of mans that, that anybody could be vulnerable with and he wouldn't judge them or think any differently um, I'll forever love him and, and thank you for the opportunity to let me speak on his behalf. Um, I'm primarily up here to deliver the words of uh, another man who knew Bobby who couldn't be here. Uh, but I just want to take a minute to say that uh, uh, I knew Bobby before I met him uh, and got to know him. I'm a, I'm a projects coordinator with, with MPAC, and we would meet every week. And then um, we also served together on the curriculum building 
uh, part of Freedom Captivity. Um, and he was someone who you just knew as like a deep friend, like right off the rip. And uh, the, the day that he passed earlier in that day, I've been talking to some friends about um, tribe and I was thinking about the people in my life who I know that I wanted to deepen my relationship with and Bobby was at the top of that list. Uh, <laughs>
I remember grieving the loss of my dear friend Chucky. Bobby came over to check on me to make sure I was all right. A few days into grieving, I remember he came over to my cell wanting to share something. With his big smile, he said, I have thought up an original quote, a quote that everyone will remember. What is it, brother, I said with curiosity, thinking he had written something about pain or grief. He looked at me, smiled, and said, I have never met a hamburger that made me mad. <laughs> we both laughed so hard, taking away the pain of our friend passing. Today we gather to celebrate his life, a man whose heart was full of compassion and love for his family, friends, and all he encountered. I remember he loved Snoopia and Sprite. <clears throat> I don't know what Snoopia is. One of you guys have to tell me after this. but uh, He was the type of person who was always happy to help, always willing to lend a listening ear and offer a kind word of encouragement no matter the situation. He was a man who dedicated himself to the betterment of others and whose generous spirit touched so many lives. In his own suffering, he made sure he showed up for others, giving others gifts, the gift of his time and presence. He put others before himself. We will all carry Bobby's spirit and memory in our hearts as we continue on our journeys. His friendship and guidance has been such a gift and he will be deeply missed. I hope and pray that wherever we go with our work, we will take attributes of Bobby with us. In the Christmas card I received a few days before his passing, he wrote something that I think he is speaking to all of us right now. I am grateful to have you in my life and I am proud of the direction your life is going. I believe good things are going to happen for you and I'm going to enjoy watching them. I believe Bobby is watching over all of us right now. If you know him like I know him, you will know he's going to be there for you, showing up in some way, shape or form. I'm sure he is multitasking right now. He's eating and keeping an eye on all of us. We love you, Bobby. Thank you. Stephen Matthew Clark. Great. Thank you all. Share a memory about Bobby with your grandfather. He's your friend. I'm Jadine, I'm Bobby's sister. This is my son Jordan, and this is JJ, aka John James. So I didn't know Bobby for very long, but I did love him for as much as most of us did. And I think one of my most fun memories I would have with him was when he came to our house around Christmas and he made gingerbread houses with us. And he encouraged me to continue eating them when mom said not to. It was a very fun night. Yeah, I am. I'm just loud. Yeah, he decorated our, our Christmas tree with us for our first. He decorated our tree with us for the first time in, yeah, 30 years. So it was really fun. Let's see anything you want to ask about this. Same again. Speak into the mic. Are you standing the boss. there? But I don't. Because you're not tall enough. Stand right there. You got the mic. Speak up. Um, one thing that I liked about him is he was always what? is he was always very nice to me and he loves me and um, um one of my favorite memories is also when he Made gingerbread houses. And was that for his room? Hmm? Was that for his room? Oh, yeah, and he picked me up upside down and made me walk on the ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. My favorite memory of my brother is all of them. I, read to, I wrote to him since I was 12 or 13. We used to talk to each other all the time, and... I'm just always going to miss him, and I hate being up here because I can't do this. That's why I made my kids come with me. And you guys have already said all that we need to know about Bobby. That he ha just has that presence that makes us all stronger, and he wants us to keep staying strong. Thank you.
My name is uh, Roland Darcy. I do uh, Kairos at Maine State Prison. <clears throat> in 1997, we got the permission to go in there. In the year 2000, uh, I was the leader of the weekend, and Bobby was on my weekend. It's a four-day retreat. It has a lot to do with religion, but we don't change anybody's religion. That's up to them. We go in and tell them our stories and how we failed at certain things and how we succeeded in certain things. So we have an open mic thing every now and then, and I asked Bobby if he wanted to talk. And he said, well, I, I didn't come here to, to get religion. He says, I came here for the food. Because <laughs> when we first started, we brought food from the outside. Only the guys inside would understand what we eat in there. So I fast, I usually give it to Bobby or give it to somebody else that would like the sandwich or like the food because you never know what's in it. And if you went there one day and you found out that you were getting soup the next day, that's the leftovers from yesterday. And the day before, they call it something else on that day. So you never, you never really realize what you're eating, so I fast. But Bobby was always there for all our reunions and all our meetings that we, get in, we came in. He became my brother. When graduation finished the fourth day, I approached Bobby to give him a cross. And on the cross it says, God is counting on you, and so are we. He wouldn't accept the cross because he hadn't decided to change religion or do anything. He went there for the food. That was his first and only line. After we did that, I said, it's a graduation gift. It's the first time you graduated from anything, so put it in your pocket, and if you ever decide to wear it, it's yours. You have the right to wear it. Deep down inside, Bobby had a mask that he wore all the time. We call it pride. He had a thing about helping you, helping Cuba, helping every one of us, okay? I went in there to help them. And every time I left there, they helped me because I was incarcerated in the old prison. And from Bobby and all the other brothers that I've met in all the years I've been in there, I've been doing this for 25 years. Deep down inside, okay, we wear a mask because there's a person that they see and they think they need to see, and then there's the person with the heart, and that's what Bobby was. He could have been a counselor to, to help anybody in this room and would have. I tried to put that in his head many times. But that isn't how Bobby worked. Bobby worked one-on-one, -on -one, and that's how he is. His love for us is just the same thing. We went in there to try to pass on to others. But we didn't pass it on to others. They gave it to us. Every time we went in, we were thieves. We walked out of there with more of understanding them than understanding our own families. I kept in touch with him. I was in court the last time he had gone back to, to prison. And he struggled. But we all struggle. Because that word pride, a lot of us have a hard time to pick up the phone, make that phone call and say, I need help. Oh, no. Bobby's big boy. I can do anything. No. No you need to pick up the phone and call. Talk to somebody. Help him before you do something stupid. And that's what people don't understand about us. We have too much pride, and we need to understand to help one another is to reach out to one another when they're hurting.
not wait until they do something stupid and then say, I need your help. It's out of our hands. Bobby is an honest, good, loving, gentle giant. When I watched him play basketball, you heard white man can't jump. Neither could Bobby. <laughs> I watched him many times, and he couldn't make that, that, that hop more than four or five inches. He just couldn't get off the ground. And we have this song that we sing, Surely the Presence. And we, we used to have a, a, a different song, I'll Fly Away. But Bobby couldn't get off the ground. So he was never going to fly away. But Bobby was an honest, good-loving person. But his past is what led him to be in there so long because he had a way out if he wanted it. And he struggled with that. So, let me turn this. Stay. Oops. Oh, I'm not calling you, Taylor. There we go. So, I thought he was going to be the last, but I just got a text message from my niece, Taylor. She's in Ohio. And she said, if you see this, it's okay. If not, it's okay. I love you. She wanted me to read this. So, it says... I'm unable to make it today, which breaks my heart. But being 33 weeks pregnant and in, in Ohio, it just wasn't in my cards to travel. If anyone would understand, I know it would be Uncle Paco. He got that, he got that life happened, and he supported you in everything and anything. I just wanted to say how grateful I am that I got to call this man my uncle. Not by blood, but by love. The first t 10 years of knowing him was through a phone and letters. I grew to look forward to the phone calls. He always held such an intelligent conversation. Family gatherings, we would all pass the phone around to have our turn talking to him. I was in the midst of my addiction through a lot of those conversations, and never once did Bobby make me feel less than. Never once did he shame me or lecture me. But there was only, but there was only love behind it. That is the thing I remember most and hold on to most from my bond with Bobby. No matter how dark my life seemed to be, he always shined a little light on it. He always offered words of encouragement, and he always cheered me on and told me how proud of me he was. His heart and soul was the purest most beautiful of anyone I'd ever met. That says a lot. His, his past and his choices were not who he was. They were stepping stones and lessons to become who he was meant to be. In the short time he was out, he struggled from time to time, but his light shined so bright, I could feel like I could see it from Ohio. He laughed and loved and got to be free, and I'm so grateful he had the time and I am grateful I got to witness it through pictures and phone calls with him. I don't know if I have accepted that he is gone because I still feel the love from him in my heart. I will keep going down this path of recovery and life with him in my heart and on my mind. And I will smile when I think of him because that's all he wanted for us. All of us was happiness and love. I am proud to be his niece, no matter where he is. Love you, Uncle Bobby.